Hello everyone, my name is Nick Lyons. I'm a veterinary epidemiologist working for EUFMD and I'm going to be providing an introduction to animal health surveillance, the objectives and options. And this is part of a virtual workshop on improving surveillance and early detection of fast diseases in the Middle East sub-region. So the learning objective here of, of, these, uh, of these topics is to understand the different types of surveillance and in national groups apply surveillance activity options to fast diseases related to your defined surveillance objective. And the expected output, what we want each, um, each country to do, is to create a document, uh, which might be called an assignment um, or exercise, which lists the objectives of the surveillance for each fast disease alongside the current activities being undertaken in your country. So with surveillance, you often get lots of definitions and I'll try and keep these to a minimum, but uh, it's quite important to distinguish between surveillance and monitoring. So surveillance is a continuous or repeated process where you measure, collect, analyze, and interpret, interpret and disseminate animal health and welfare related data from defined populations. And these data are essential for describing disease occurrence and to contribute to the planning, implementation and evaluation of control measures. So the key thing here is that it must be continuous or repeated. A single SERA survey or, or exercise to collect, uh, to collect any sort of data can, may contribute towards surveillance, but unless it's continuous, done repeatedly uh, and, is and is linked to your an, an action, uh, then it doesn't really count as, um, as, as surveillance. Monitoring differs from surveillance in that it's, you can do the same, um, uh, the same data collection, but there's no actions associated with it. So you just measure and collect data, but then nothing really happens as a, as a consequence, and that's known as monitoring. And there's a very useful publication, uh, which I'll give um, uh, alongside this uh, module, which uh, describes this in more detail for those that are interested. So when it comes to your surveillance objectives, this depends really on two different criteria. One is the current disease or infection status in your country, and two is the objectives of any control strategy you have. So here you'll see the very familiar PCP um, pathway for the mouth disease, and in each one of these stages, uh, the, there is a difference in what your disease or infection status might be, but also what the objectives of your control strategy is. So actually your surveillance objectives will vary with the different stages of the PCP. So in this, uh, on this slide here, what I've done is I've, I've created the different uh, disease or infection status. Um, so you should be able to see my uh, cursor here. So um, th these are the different possible categories. So it might be unknown, you just don't know what disease status you have. You might know it's endemic, so it means that it's continually present, the disease or pathogen. Um, it might be sporadic, so you have intermittent or irregular um, uh, outbreaks that occur. You might believe that you're free from disease or infection, or indeed you might be confirmed free of disease or infection. So for each of these different um, categories of, of disease or infection status, you might have different surveillance objectives. So if your disease, if, you're, if it's unknown, then your surveillance objective might be to describe the baseline incidence and impact. If you're endemic, but you, but so you know you're endemic or you're, or you're, you're pretty confident you're endemic, but you're, you're doing nothing about it, so there's no control measures, then again, your surveillance objective might be the same, to describe the baseline incidence and impact. However, if you are controlling the disease, then you might actually decide um, to, to have different objectives. Well, you have to have different objectives um, in, in the, when you're controlling. So you might measure any changes in the, in the incidence uh, to show that the control is working. But also you may want to detect cases of disease to facilitate control so that you can actually uh, respond to an outbreak to try and reduce the impact of the outbreak. If the disease is sporadic in your country, then you might, then you have a slightly different approach. So you don't measure the change in the incidence, but you still want to detect cases to facilitate control, but you also want to have early case detection. 
if you believe that you're free from disease or infection, then what you'll want to do is you still want to have measures in place, like surveillance in place, so that you can detect cases early if they do occur. But you also may want to uh, demonstrate freedom from disease. But I've put the arrow here like as dashed. And the reason for that is you really want to have an economic case for demonstrating freedom, because it might be quite a substantial investment to demonstrate freedom. Um, but you want to make sure you get the benefits from that. So that might be in terms of trade or, 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 or well, usually it's because of trade. And the final category is if you are confirmed free from disease or infection. So you've done uh, various studies or you've got surveillance in place already, which shows that you're free, or it might be an OIE um, confirmed uh, disease-free status. So then what you want to do is you want to then maintain that status. So you want to uh, continually demonstrate freedom, uh, and you, but you also want to have measures in place so that you can detect cases early if cases occur. So one of the distinctions I want to make here is the difference between passive and active surveillance. So if we start with active surveillance, so this is very much initiated by the investigator. So here might be your investigator uh, sitting at a desk, might be an epidemiologist in your, in your central or regional office. And what they do is they might then send um, a vet or an animal health worker out to go and try and find clinical disease or infection. And that might be going to um, uh, going to farms or going to markets and trying to find diseased animals, or they might be looking for evidence of exposure, like doing sera surveys, for example. So that might then generate some samples that go to a laboratory, and, and the data are then fed back to uh, the investigator, who then disseminates that data. So they should disseminate it back to the vet or people that have done the work, and of course, other, um, uh, other, other, their colleagues as well but also to the, to the farmer to the, or to the people that you've done the sampling from or other stakeholders. Passive surveillance is different in that it is observer initiated. So you might have an outbreak uh, that occurs and this would be clinical disease and then you have some observer. So it might be a farmer like the picture represents here, but it could be any number of uh, stakeholders. So they observe the disease and what they might do then is call their vet or animal health service provider, who then might have a dialogue with your uh, investigator, um, who then might uh, communicate back with the vet to go to attend the outbreak. And this, do this doesn't necessarily occur. Sometimes the vet might attend the outbreak without that, that step, depending if there's a protocol in place, but, but it may also involve the, the investigator. So the vet goes to the, to the outbreak, um, they might take some samples that go to the laboratory and then those samples go or those results then get communicated with an investigator who again then disseminates the information to the vet or to the or, or and to the to the farmer who or, or the stakeholder who reported the clinical disease that's the way it should occur you might also uh, hear of something called extended passive surveillance so this is the same uh, process essentially but the difference is, is that the investigator um, is trying to encourage the farmer or stakeholders to report disease. And this might be through awareness campaigns, or it might be some compensation if they report disease. And it might be also be through public-private partnerships, which can take a, a, a variety of different forms. But that's known as extended passive surveillance. So under your surveillance objectives, you then have different surveillance components. And these specific surveillance activities are conducted to investigate the occurrence of one or more uh, hazards or, or pathogens. And these components of your surveillance plan are directly linked to what your objective is. And you often use more than one approach, more than one component. And one component may cover multiple diseases. So each surveillance component will have particular characteristics. So for example, it might be passive or active. There might be a different frequency. So it might be yearly. So you might do a yearly zero survey, for example, or you might have continuous passive surveillance. You might be focusing on different species, again, depending on what your surveillance objective is. You might focus on different production systems, so dairy systems or small ruminants, pastoralist, nomadic, it, it depends. 
And of course, there might be different geographical um, regions that you might be focusing on, um, depending again on what your surveillance objective is. So you'll have various different options of what type of surveillance you, you do in, for these different components. So for passive surveillance, uh, this is um, suspected clinical disease reports uh, that are observer initiated. So this could come from uh, farmers, from abattoirs, from markets, or, 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 an, or other animal health workers like, um, like vets. And under active surveillance, you might have different types of surveys. So these might be surveys for clinical disease, surveys for um, infection, so doing serial surveys, for example. Um, you might have surveys of farms, of, of markets, of abattoirs. You might also have sentinel surveillance, uh, and I'll describe that later uh, in a couple of minutes, and also participatory surveillance, which again I'll describe in a couple of minutes. So in as, as an example of how your surveillance uh, objectives and, and, and how the components might work, so uh, you might be a country that's endemic for, for the mouth disease, you might have a control strategy in place to reduce the impact in the dairy cattle sector. So your objective of your surveillance might be to measure changes in the incidence of FMD in dairy cattle. So then you have different components of what your surveillance is. So under passive surveillance, you might have uh, farmers, this might be aimed at um, farmers continuously reporting suspected clinical signs over the whole country. So this, is, uh, this might cover all sectors, but often these components do cover diff different um, different sectors, but it contributes to this surveillance objective. But then you might have an extended passive surveillance in the dairy cattle sector by having annual awareness campaigns, for example. Active surveillance might be doing surveys for clinical disease among, the da among dairy farmers, but you might also have something like vets at markets examining a sample of animals for evidence of recent clinical disease. And again, that, that might cover more than one sector, but it, might, but it should contribute to your surveillance objective as well, of measuring changes in incidence of FMD in dairy cattle. So it might not be a direct measurement of that, but it, 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 sh it should be related in, in some way to your surveillance objective. So I just want to quickly explain what these surveillance terms are, because you might hear them in other, um, in, in, in the literature or in your reading. So participatory surveillance is when you have a community-based semi-structured interviews to try and identify cases of disease. You might have sentinel surveillance, which is when you have repeated sampling of the same group or sites to identify changes over time. And this should represent your population of interest. So in the dairy uh, cattle sector, for example, you might have select uh, farms that you repeatedly sample or you repeatedly visit um, and those represent the dairy cattle sector in your country. Syndromic surveillance is something uh, different where you're, this is based on the clinical signs or, or other measures to indicate population health, which may then lead to further investigation. So you're not necessarily measuring a specific um, hazard or disease. You might be looking at something like abortions or milk yields. And typically, this type of surveillance might cover many diseases and is used for early warning surveillance. And a, a very good example of syndromic surveillance is the Schmallenberg virus um, uh, surveillance that took place, um, uh, particularly in Europe, uh, uh, over the recent few years. So that's the end of this presentation. Uh, these are just some references that you may want to look at. The RiskSure website that I've provided here is a fantastic resource for uh, various parts of surveillance and I've, used, uh, and I've used some of the information from there as part of these slides and these publications here are related to, to that project. Thank you.